plays as a word often used to describe Nenalal Kidwai. The first Indian woman to pass out of Harvard Business School, one of the first women investment bankers in the country, one of the first women to lead a financial powerhouse and the first woman to head the 87-year-old industry association FICI. So just when PepsiCo head Indra Nooyi kicked up a global storm and debate when she said that women can't have it all. I caught up with Nena and asked her what she thought of it. Let me tell you, it's easier talking about the economy than about these issues. So, so Indra, now she's uh, not just an icon, she's a wonderful person, a, a great mom, a great uh, corporate leader. And uh, in that sense, uh, from the outside in, she's uh, hugely successful because uh, she is, uh, you know, a mother, a wife, a daughter-in-law, a daughter and uh, a corporate leader. Uh, so I think she has it all. So I don't know where she's coming from. She's probably set too high a standard for herself in terms of what she believes she should be. Uh, it isn't an easy balancing act. Let's face it. And for those of us that want to excel in every way, you want your home to be just right. You want your kids to be just right. You want to be the perfect wife, the perfect daughter-in-law, the perfect daughter. And you want to be uh, a leader in the corporate world. It isn't easy. And uh, I think there are various stages and phases in one's life where one thing takes precedence over another. And you could call it sacrifice, but I just always viewed it as a practical balancing act. And you have to be lucky uh, in that the support systems that you have around you bail you out at these times. The right husband in particular, so that you're not facing that guilt all the time. Uh, kids in that when they're young, they should be healthy and you know well adapted, so you're not having to worry about them. And of course, the support system through domestic help uh, that is there 24 hours for you, and the moms and mother-in-laws and sisters and family that step in when you need them. So it is a whole system around you that you build. And uh, I'm one of those people who planned for every contingency. Uh, I plan with lists. Uh, I'm someone who packs like two weeks in advance in anticipation of the fact that the next two weeks are going to be so busy that I won't have time to pack. So I, I just plan and plan in a way that enables me to do uh, most of the things I would like to. One of the fundamental uh, questions and one of the ironies of it all is that while I'm having a conversation about uh, this with you, I've never asked a uh, 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 gentleman, <laughs> that how does he balance, balance you know, home and, yeah. and work and what does he do if he has a, 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 a child who's unwell? So yeah. in, in that sense, is it also a, a, a probably a mental conditioning that uh, women think of all these things, men, uh, you know, don't really obsess about it as much as we do? I think that's true. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the Indian man though has, uh, for example, often worried about parents. And I'm amazed how often uh, we have male colleagues who either call off duty or indeed even ask for long leave because they have sick parents, often living with them. Uh, they're the only son, maybe the only child uh, who believes they have to look after them. Uh, I'm sure that this young generation going forward is a little different. Uh, they see their role in the family as a far more uh, um, part of being the family and uh, we will see more of that heavy lifting but you're right uh, did I am sure that in my generation at any rate every one of us women uh, believed it was our responsibility yeah. and uh, shared with the husband but our responsibility and to that extent Indira's right that there was always a sense of guilt and in fact, my husband mentioned this to me even today. He says, you know, you think you've brought up our daughter? I have, because every time there were tough decisions, I had to take them because you were so guilty all the time that you gave in to her all the time. And so there it is. My question to you is that, uh, you know, you, you've actually uh, been a trailblazer in many senses. Okay, so I'm going to really rewind to the time when you were growing up. What, what I've often uh, wondered is that why hasn't any conversation with you spoken about uh, your grandfather, Casey Thapar, who was one of the most uh, famous and one of the biggest uh, industrialists in India. Yeah. It's so patriarchal that, you know, you're never 
associated with him. Yeah. You know, a Gotham Thapar is, yeah. and the, the rest of the Thapar uh, yeah. clan is, but you're not because you were the daughter's daughter. Correct. So growing up, uh, did you think you had a right to the, to the you know, the empire, so to say, or a larger role to play, or, or did it not come into your mind? I think the answer is in the question and the way you asked it, Minit. So the answer is no. Uh, I was the daughter's daughter. Uh, there were only men and boys in the family business ever. And uh, of the next generation, uh, my cousins, pretty much no one works either. Mm. Uh, so it's really only my sister and I who uh, have uh, chosen a career. Or uh, my aunt's daughter, who is an entrepreneur. So it tells you all. So the girl's side moved on uh, with no aspiration and no expectation of being part uh, of the family Looking business. Looking back, have you ever wondered why didn't I think of it? Or no, because I don't think I would have uh, worked out there. I was uh, someone who wanted to cast my own course, mm. was very confident in my ability to do so. And uh, I think my advice also to young children when they go into the family business is often you, you need to spread your wings outside of the business. You need to be on a path of self-discovery. You need to be out of a system where you have people kowtowing to you because you're the boss's daughter. How, I mean, it's impossible to learn in an environment where uh, nobody's telling you how bad you are and you go away thinking you're the cat's whiskers when actually you're not. When you sit across the table with a lot of uh, owners of family-owned businesses, do you see this patriarchy existent or do you think a lot of that is changing and the younger generation is being more demanding now? Well, uh, it's uh, changing, not changing fast enough. I, some of it may begin to happen now with the next generation where the girls are as educated, if not more educated, than the boys. And uh, they themselves will have uh, demands and expectations to this effect. And I think some of the rules that are coming in now in terms of bringing women onto corporate boards, even when they are family members coming on, I would have you know, like to see where it is a family member that be the younger members of the family so that the next generation sees this as a training ground. Because when you sit on a board, you begin to understand a number of issues. I mean, the, the learnings I've had by sitting on the Nestle board are huge, are better than any classroom education. Today, some of India's biggest banks and financial companies are led by women. But in 1982, when Naina graduated from business school, few women thought of investment banking as a career. Naina did, and she believes that her two years at Harvard laid the foundation for a lot of what she has achieved. Uh, Harvard, way back in 1980, when I went, uh, was uh, there was 17% of the student body was wim were women. Uh, today it's now almost 50-50. Uh, so we were very much a minority. There were two Asian women in the whole class. Mm -hmm. There was myself and a girl from Singapore. So uh, we were, I was different. Uh, I can't say it bothered me, but I was not sure of my own ability in a class like that. And certainly in the first week in class, where Americans seem to be able to speak even before they think, whereas I had to think, order my thoughts and speak, and it was too late, somebody else had made the point, which was very quick learning on my part to have to you put up your hand before you've actually thought through the entire point and make sure you make the point. And that was also an advantage because you, as the only Asian woman in the class, when you put your hand up, the teacher asked you. So you ended up getting more class participation than anyone else because they wanted the diversity of viewpoint. So it helped. And I found that I could use that to advantage and did. And uh, loved the class, loved everything uh, that uh, it brought me. In terms of confidence, the ability to think on my feet, the ability to work long hours, the ability to process huge amounts of data that were thrown at us in a case and process it down to something that was meaningful. But I think the biggest learning was much more on areas to do with self-confidence and ability. 
because what you learn five years later is no longer fashionable and no longer applicable. But what you learn, which is the ability to keep learning and the self-confidence and to be able to throw in the deep end and perform, those are things which don't come readily. You were telling me, which is an amazing uh, fact, that uh, out of the class, out of the 17% uh, women, very few actually are still working. Yeah. In a sense that in, even at that time in the US, at her Harvard, was there the same pressure for women to fall off when they had families? Is this yes. a universal thing that you see? I think uh, at that time, and for my generation in the US, it was clearly an issue. And I saw it. I mean, friends of mine had their first child, they continued to work. By the time the second child came, there's no way you can manage your home in the US with your husband working and you working and two young children at home. Uh, you know, daycare centers, they close at five. I mean, I remember sitting beside this friend of mine who I had joined at work because I was going to spend the night with her in Boston. And we were careening down these highways because she was getting late because the daycare center was to shut. We arrived there at, you know, 10 minutes late. She, the child is the last child crying and saying, mom, again, it was a guilt trip, child unhappy, left there as the last child. I mean, you know, uh, mom now how, almost in tears after she's almost killed everyone on the road trying to get there. Uh, then she comes home, she has to cook. It was just, I was like, my God, how are you doing? And that was one child. By the time she had the second, I didn't even have to ask her, why have you stopped working? So how did you manage? You went very quickly into investment banking. You were very, very successful early on. You got huge amount of responsibility. It was a tough job. One of the things that happens is you push the decision out till quite late. So I had uh, uh, my daughter quite late. You know, I was 32, 33. I sort of pushed it to the last point one could because it was a scary decision. Okay, and, you know, I'm not going to be able to balance and manage this. Uh, and then when it happens, the choice of then having one child instead of two, having seen what the two-child syndrome did to all my friends at business school, it was like, oh my God, uh, maybe, you know, we'll just limit it to the one because it's going to be easier to handle this way. Uh, I think I was very clear that I wanted both parts of my life. I wanted work. I wanted a family. And uh, that I was going to make it work for me. And once you set your mind on that, it works. I think the other privilege which uh, you know, you, we were you know, just touching on is that as women, we are privileged in that we know that we don't have to work. We can pick the job that works for us, that makes us happy. Uh, there's nobody out there who's telling us you have to work. The poor guy knows that he has to have a job. Uh, in fact, his ego is going to be severely bruised if he doesn't have a job. Nobody in the outside world is going to readily accept that he doesn't work. And as a woman, you could work, you need not. What you work at is your decision. And what a privilege is that. So I would say the first guiding principle, and certainly worked for me, is I have to love what I do. I, I love my work, and I want it. And because I want it, I'm going to make my family work for me and my work work for me because I want both. A lot of what you have experienced uh, and learned from, you know, you've uh, institutionalized within the bank, for instance, in HSBC. I know you have some very progressive, uh, you know, uh, policies for women, etc. Yeah. My question to you is, what are the learnings when you, when you sit on a Nestle board or when you work with HSBC internationally? What should Indian companies be looking at? So I think the main uh, concept has to be the buy-in at the top that women are important to you in your workforce either because you need the diversity of that skill set or because the talent that is otherwise available to you is half what is otherwise available to you so for us uh, women that work for us are central to our talent teams and pools uh, we have about a third of our workforce today that are women across our various entities in india and the key issue became, in fact, at hiring, it's 50-50 uh, when we go to the institutes now. So what we get is a good mix. However, women do tend to drop away mm -hmm. in certain stages. And this would typically be three to four years into work experience. Uh, they either leave uh, because of children or and uh, other reasons of similar order. So the programs that we built in are to ensure that they come back. Because what often happens is they drop away and then they don't know how to get back. 
or the traditional three months maternity leave was too short, they wanted longer, so they leave the organization. So the programs we have now are we stay in touch with anyone who chooses to leave. Our maternity program is now six months and you can pretty much take another six months to so take a year off with no issue. Paternity leave so that the husband's there part of the process. And uh, flexi hours, so if you come back, you work half a day, etc. And it's not just for women. It's a program for all our employees. And in fact, the, pick up, the take up rate was higher by men than for women. So there were men who wanted to do it. Some wanted sabbatical, some wanted to run their own NGO. Many wanted to look after their parents. Uh, so everyone has a reason to sometimes balance something at home with work. And what we have enabled as a result is uh, that. towards a regime where the uh, the policymakers have mandated a uh, woman on the board of big companies and more and more companies are suddenly waking up to the fact that they have to. Do you think it's a positive step because there are very strong views for and against yeah. it right now? Uh, I think a positive step. I mean I should tell you that when I was heading the diversity effort for HSBC in India and the region, uh, I believed that quotas were bad and I would rather set it as a visionary thing, you know, we want at that time, there used to be 5% women in our workforce. We want 25% women in our workforce by 2015, for example, and set that as a vision and a target rather than a quota. Uh, because I didn't want anyone in the organization to feel that women were getting there for any reason other than that they were capable. However, Sometimes when you start at the pathetic levels that we have in India where you know 3% of women sit on boards and we want to grow that number, you have to give it a push. And this quota, this ensuring that there's one woman on a board is a great way of getting scaled in terms of talent that is latent, not yet discovered, but needs a push. Why is a woman on the board useful? A woman on a board, for one, the woman herself is going to learn. And I think for middle management women who get on boards, the learning experience is huge. For girls and families who the family probably hasn't even discovered what their capability is, to have them on the board, the learning there is huge. I think the board also benefits from a diversity of viewpoint because you get another thought process, another input. And for the women that are there, uh, if picked well, whether from the family or from uh, the external world as non-executive directors and there are many out there. They don't all have to be CEOs of companies, they can be the next level down. The experience they bring, it's important that you pick the right type of person, that you be someone who will speak up at the board level but will also contribute to the process. So I think for the first women on the boards it's not going to be easy. Uh, some boards may even be somewhat hostile. Many may even look down and, you know, why are you here? You don't quite fit the, the ilk and, you know, you're half my age or whatever it be. But those women are going to have to blaze the trail and carry, frankly, on their shoulders what the new India looks like. So I hope for those that get there, if they aren't equipped, they're being trained, they're being mentored, they are also rising to the challenge and taking that duty seriously because they are going to have to mentor the next generation. Mm -hmm. With a huge responsibility and an important one out there. My question to you is, uh, you have a daughter. Yeah. What advice would you give her? And a lot of young women who are watching this show and they feel that what you have achieved is so far out on top. I mean, you've yeah. been such a uh, shooting star that, you know, it, it's difficult to catch up and, and emulate you in that yeah. sense. What would your advice be to them? Well, listen, I don't think, uh, sh you know, the shooting star and all of that holds at all. Because I think we all, when we start up, you don't dream up there. I didn't think were you, I were would... You, were you very ambitious when you started? Or you I, were always I was a always. class stopper and you always, you know, one of, were one of the go-getters from what I, I was understand. I was always competitive. Mm -hmm. uh, so, which, so that was, I think, the good part was that you put me in a group and I was going to try and make sure I was as good, if not better. So, in that sense, it was positive because if I worked in the right organizations with good people around me, 
I was always working at getting Better. to. The, I hated politics. I never played that that course. For me, it was really about proving to myself that I was as good as anyone else, and so that helps uh, to a point. But never ambitious enough to believe I would be CEO of a bank because I no? didn't. I didn't see it. there were no other women there. Uh, it wasn't just about women. The journey was so far out. So for all of us, when we start at the bottom, you don't begin about thinking about, yes, that's where I want to go. But you begin to see the next level up. And you think that's what I could be. And what am I lacking that would stand in the way? Or what do I have that could get me there? And hopefully you see some of the traits that will get you there so you don't give up. And so you plan one and two steps ahead. And that's how the journey goes. So my advice will always be, do your best. And do your best does not mean you work like a dog. It means you work in a sensible, balanced way. You have to make friends in the place where you work. So your emotional side in the organization is equally important. You, beyond a point, you could be the best nerd there is, the best number cruncher. But if you don't fit in the organization, you aren't able to manage teams, you're going to stop being advanced up there. So it's a many faceted aspect of you that an organization wants. So developing all of those, you know, your natural personality, uh, your ability to work in teams, are as critical as your ability at work. In fact, in many ways, the ability at work is the easiest because that's sort of a given. It's the other things that have to count as well. And for the young women out there, I think it's, I would just say, follow your heart. That if you enjoy what you do, all of this will come naturally to you because you like the people you work with, you're going to be nice with everyone. You like what you do, you're going to work hard. And when you find that, it's important that you find that space for yourself, that it isn't an internal struggle each day about, oh, I really don't like the people at work and I hate what I do. You're never going to cut it. So be true to yourself. Find what that internal anchoring for yourself is. And for each of one, it's different. And at different points in our life, it will be different. If that internal anchor is re telling you that you, know, you want to and need to be at home, and you're not feeling bad about giving up work. If you are, then you have to do both. So you take those choices for yourself, but make sure you think through it before you do. And the great thing today is organizations today understand this, and they will help you come back into the workplace if indeed you leave it just for a while. Last question, looking back, would you do anything differently? No, absolutely not. Uh, I think uh, when I look back, uh, I've been very lucky that I've had it all. What I might have done is worked a little less hard. I really? feel that I was very hard on myself. I was hard on myself because uh, I did feel I had to prove myself every time. I firmly believe that I had to be better than my male colleagues to be recognized. I mean, I grew up, I hope that that is not the case today in an organization. It certainly was uh, when I set off. And as a result, uh, I carried the burden of all womankind on me. I always felt that people were looking to see if I fell on my face. And if I did, it was not going to be a failure just for me, but it was for all the women who were coming up behind me. Those burdens can be quite hard. They push us. But I think as a result, we are also a little harder on ourselves than we need to be. So I wish I had enjoyed myself more. I see my daughter enjoying herself much more at work. Uh, and I, I think I could have enjoyed myself a little bit more if I wasn't just so hard on myself. Maybe you shouldn't overanalyze it. Just yeah. go with the flow. Go with the flow. Exactly. <laughs> oh, thank you yeah. so much, Nana. Okay. It was lovely.